All right, so this is uh, SharePoint 2013 display templates and query rules. Everything I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing in Office 365, but you can do all of this on-prem as well, okay? So there's, in fact, there's more that you can do on-prem with the query rules because the query rule, um, the query rules that we're running in Office 365, they've sort of trimmed them down, I believe, for performance reasons, but um, the, they're, it's, we're splitting hairs. There's really subtle differences, but it's not anything major. Um, my name is Matt McDermott. I'm a SharePoint MVP. I love coming to Evo Conference. I was one of five people last year that did all 12 sessions at the, uh, at the road show. It was epic. We had so much fun. But um, um, I, uh, I work for a company called Aptalon with four friends of mine. I am a SharePoint consultant. I'm also a SharePoint trainer. I'm also a SharePoint dog guy. The other reason I love coming to Evo Conference, they take really good care of my wife. We do have to leave Ruby behind, but you'll see some shots of her as we go through. Um, she and I compete in this dog sport called agility, so uh, I have a lot of videos online. That's what she looks like today, because uh, we left. And um, I'm also an author. I've done a lot of technical editing. I'm a trainer. I work with Critical Path Training as a, as a teacher for their Building Business Solutions class and the admin class. Um, the salient points here are my Twitter handle is Matthew McD. My blog is ableblue.com slash blog. I tend to go very quickly through my demos because it's not a how-to. It's a how can I and what are the ideas? What are the things that I can do with display templates and query rules to improve my end user's search experience? If you want the nuts and bolts details, particularly the very first demo that I do, it is spelled out in great detail on my blog. So this is just kind of a fun session to see a bunch of demos and understand how the pieces fit together. If you have questions afterwards and we don't get a chance to see me here in the sessions tonight when we're drinking downstairs, later on tonight when we're drinking around the corner, uh, Tuesday night when we're drinking at the, at the um, um, at, you get where we're going with this, right? Wherever there's a drink ticket, you can find me and get some free SharePoint consulting. Um, email me at matthew at aptalon.com. Just remind me of the session you're in so that I can remember how to justify the lies that I've told. And, uh, and we'll get along just fine. So we're going to talk about search. In this session, I'm going to be focusing on display templates and query rules. I'm doing another session tomorrow where I'm going to talk about kind of the other stuff around search in Office 365 that we bolt together to make these kinds of solutions work. So we'll talk about improving the presentation of search results, refinement, and some of the controls that you have access to. And then in the second half, how to implement query rules, and hopefully, depending on how fast our internet connection is, we'll be able to show you a live deployment of these changes using out-of-the-box tools to get your display templates, to get your query rules from one site collection to another, or potentially from an on-prem environment where you've been doing your testing and all your wizardry into a cloud environment. I'm working on a session. I'll just give you a preview here. This is going to be the out-of-the-box deployment, what Microsoft tells you works, and I'll show you what doesn't work. Um, I am working with a friend of mine on a whole session on deploying your stuff using PowerShell. So if you're an IT pro and you're interested in that, keep an eye on my blog or on IT Unity, and, and we'll bring that stuff up. Your mother ever tell you to eat your vegetables? Right? Before you get dessert, you have to eat your vegetables. Crawled and managed properties are the vegetables of search. You have to understand the relationship between crawled properties and managed properties in order to be good at doing search solutions in SharePoint. It's not really that complicated. In SharePoint 2013, either in the cloud or on-prem, there are three processes that, that happen that send the information that is crawled into the index. The first is the act of crawling. During the crawling process, simply links are enumerated and crawled off of a web page. If it's SharePoint content, it makes a request to the SharePoint data provider, which tells it much more, tells the uh, crawler much more about the, the structure of your site, of the lists and libraries on your site. And then all of that information is passed into the content processor. The content processor is incredibly busy. One of the things it does is it finds, in, a, in the case of a SharePoint list or library, it finds the properties that are on those lists and libraries. You might call them columns. If you're using site columns in SharePoint 2013, you are ahead of the game. If you don't know what a site column is, Lori Gowan did two sessions on SharePoint Basics earlier today where she was talking about the use of site columns. Very, very important concept in SharePoint 
because in SharePoint 2013, they are automatically managed. They're automatically turned into searchable columns for us. But if you're not doing that, if you want to do this manually, you still can. What we do is we manage these properties through the content processing process, and we turn those particular columns that may have any kind of different names into names that we as the search professionals know that we're going to use in our queries. So for instance, I might call product cost that field that is the list price. I might call product color that field that is the product color. It doesn't matter what it comes from, that crawled property name. What matters to me is the managed property name. Tomorrow in my demos, I'll be talking more about that and how you actually create these things. But just trust me, think of them as data fields in SQL. If you don't know the names of the columns, then you say select star and it gives you all of the column names back. We can kind of do the same thing in, in SharePoint search. Plus we can get custom properties out and we can get built in properties. Like for instance, is document is an important one. That's going to rule out anything that's not an actual document or web page. So for instance, sites will not show up if I say is document is true. There's even an is my documents attribute that says it's coming off of your OneDrive. Okay, so you can actually do a query against uh, documents in your OneDrive from anywhere in SharePoint by simply saying is my documents is true. So once we understand how these managed properties work, we can start using them in our search solutions. So how are search results generated in SharePoint? Well, a query is executed by an end user. Now they may go to the search center and they may fat finger in a query and hit go. That would be a query that they would execute. But you can also embed a web part on a page, like a content by search web part, that when the page is refreshed, it executes the query. Same action is interpreted by SharePoint that that's a query against the search index. Before it goes to the search index, it goes through something called the query rules parser. This is going to evaluate whether that query matches any of the query rules that we've created. We'll be creating query rules in just a minute. And once those query rules are evaluated, the, the uh, query is sent off to the index and returns where we can actually have query rules look at the results that came back as well. So we can say, does the query contain a keyword? Or did the result set contain some stuff that I'm interested in as well? So we have two opportunities to look at what the end user is doing. And then two important things happen. How many of you worked in search in SharePoint 2010? How many of you enjoyed the XSL part of that? Right? None of you. It's horrible. Why? Because SharePoint, you try to go and get just a little sip of the results and instead it throws a 55 gallon drum on you of results. You have to look at all of the results. In SharePoint 2013, we get to look at each result independently. So that's why these result types are important to us. We look at the result types, we create a rule that says it's a Word document or it's a PDF or it's a contract or it's a product because we start using content types that way. And once I know exactly what result type I have, I create a one-to-one -one mapping to the display template. Not, I have 50 results per page in that XSL, and I have to say, are you a document? Are you a document? Are you a document? Now you get one rule to drive the display of your search result. All of this happens tremendously fast, and that way we create our search results page or if you've seen the content by search demos, we can also create product catalog pages the same way. So the same process works whether we're driving search results or we're driving content by search because content by search uses display templates as well. We all good with that? So managed properties, way important. I'll, go into, I'll do demos tomorrow on how to create managed properties, but I'm going to use them today. So. When do you need a display template? You need a display template when your awesome results look this bad, okay? If you do a BCS connection to a, uh, to a line of business data source, this is what you're gonna, if you do a good job with it, this is what you'll get back. If you do a bad job, it'll look a lot worse, it won't be clickable, and there'll be all kinds of things wrong with it. But that's not what my customer looks like. My customer looks like this. My customer has clickable fields, so I can actually send an email to my customer directly out of the search center. I can IM because the 
the account managers are a part of my organization, I can start a link conversation directly from the search page about this customer. If I'm going to visit that customer, I can get a map to their location directly out of the search results. This is all trivially easy to do because as long as I have the data, I can render anything I want in the search result page using result, result types tied to a custom display template. So this is what I'm talking about when I think of display templates. What about graphical refiners? Well, in my case, my partners have different levels, gold, silver, and bronze. I was in kind of an Olympic mood when I was building this. But this looks terrible. Plus, it takes up this much real estate for three little words. Why not do something like this, where we actually use color? You know, why not use something like this if you're in an Olympic mood? So you've got gold, silver, and bronze medals that are clickable. Okay, easy, easy stuff to do. Out of the box, we get this, this, um, this wonderful bar chart with a slider on it so that we can actually drag things around. So in this case, I've wired up year-to-date sales to that. If I know the country, I could do a distribution graph because the search results are spitting back to me the count of the number of items in the search result set. So I could do a bar chart, I could do a pie chart, and now I'm starting to be able to do actual intelligence inside my query. I can say how many of my customers sold more than $100,000 worth of stuff and are in the United States. I can start seeing those kinds of results right in my search center. So the, the, county, chart, the county chart there is just using some jQuery, and of course the year-to-date sales distribution is using the out-of-the-box um, out template. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I call Display Template 101, just so we get everybody on the same page about how difficult this is. Here's the scenario. I have, uh, I have my search center here. And what I'm going to do is just do a simple search for SharePoint. And when I do this search, what I want to do is jump over to the people search results. Because in my people search results, I have my people coming back. There's Ruby. And one of the things I notice is that the initiative that we have going to show off people's, for instance, their skills, like right here I have Ruby happens to be a notary, okay? And um, we also have some custom metadata values like we have their Twitter account name. So here's Ruby's Twitter account name, but it's not showing up in search. So what I want to do is I want to add that Twitter account name into the search results page so that for the people that are filling out their Twitter account in our user profile, we can show that on the page and make it clickable. <laughs> Trivially easy to do. The first thing you have to know is which display template do you copy first? This is called the item person display template, so I'm going to copy that one. If you're on-prem and you do this, you go into Design Manager, and inside Design Manager, you'll have a link here called Upload Design Files. And this link will be clickable. For some reason in Office 365, it's not. Okay? So let's go the way that I can go. 100% of the time will work for you as long as you have a design, the design permission on your site. Go into Master Pages and Page Layouts. And then treat this library. Somehow my glasses got bent today. While this is coming up, let me see if I can fix this. So this will bring up a file explorer. And so I'm going to go into the cleverly titled Display Templates folder. And then I have Search, I have Filters, and I have Content Web Parts. I'm going to go into Search because that's where the display templates for search results are. But if you want to create um, a rendering for a um, content by search web part, you would put it in the Content Web Parts folder because the Content Web Part, when it looks for the display template, it's going to look in there. If you create a refiner like I'll do later, you would put it in the filters folder. That's where that web part is looking. So we're going to go into search, and we're going to see that there's a whole bunch of different display templates in here. Some are called control. Some are called item. Some are called group. I'll talk about that in a slide in just a moment. But what I'm going to do is drop down here to item person. There's an HTML and a JS file. You always, always work with the HTML file. I'm just going to take this. And let's, uh, let's get rid of that slide real quick. And I'm going to drag the item person, item person HTML file onto my desktop. I'm going to say, yes, I trust that site. And hopefully, 
It'll copy it to my my desktop and delete it. Thank you for doing that. It's on the right. Is it? Oh, there it is, right where I dragged it. Thank you. If your site's not trusted in Office 365, your client OS sometimes will not let you download the file that way. So you have to set up the trust relationship. Anyway, I'm simply opening the file in Notepad++ here. And um, the thing you have to do is you have to put a new string on here. So I'm going to call this one twit. And I'm going to scroll out. Right here are my managed property mappings. You can think of this as the query. What columns am I asking the display template to return? So I'm going to come out here. I'm going to go comma, quote, quote, colon, quote, quote. And my account is Twitter account name. Oops. So we'll copy that. Put that right in there. Okay, so I've got the account name now. And so where my designer wanted to see this, they wanted to see this right after the name field. So working with a syntax highlighting editor is paramount. I do know some guys in the product team that still do this with Notepad. I think they're nuts. I can click name field. I can see the closing div. So we're going to put it right after that. And I'm just going to create a div. And then I'm going to close that div. And then I'm going to put in here what the designer wanted to see which was they wanted to see Twitter with two T's. And then they wanted to see like the at sign and Matthew McD. They wanted to see it look like that. So what we have to do is we have to set up some token substitution so that we can swap out the Matthew McD part for our actual Twitter account name. So let me get the rest of this set up. I'm going to do an href. We're going to set that href to HTTP, just two T's, there we go. Uh, Twitter. Well, if I can get through this without, the, the angle of the, um, of the podium is kind of odd. And we want that to go to Matthew McD as well. Then we'll go ahead and set this to a target equal to underscore blank, just a little trick to make it open in a new window. Okay, so I've got all my HTML in, and now we have to look at doing the token substitution. So I look, and right up here at the top, I see that encoded path. So there are examples of this all over this default file. That underscore pound equals equals pound underscore tells SharePoint to stop processing HTML, start processing variables off the page. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to grab this right here, and I'm going to go equals pound underscore. Which is a really tough key co keyboard combination to do. And then here we'll go equals pound underscore to close it out. And then this Matthew McD becomes my Twitter account name. Now, if it was a JavaScript variable, I'd be done. But in this case, this is actually a, the context of the current item off of the search results. So there's an example of that right here. I can just grab that, and I can copy it down. That's all I need to do. I'm going to copy all of this now, and I'm going to swap it out for the Matthew McD that's right there. OK, so I can save this. That's all the code you're going to see today. The rest of it's going to be demos. Minimize this guy. Come on, go away. There we go. Okay, one last thing that I need to do. I need to rename this file so that I don't overwrite the existing out-of-the-box file. So I'm going to call this one Twitter as well. And then I'm just going to drag it and drop it back into SharePoint. I'm going to drag it and drop it. There it goes. Okay, so I drag it and drop it back into SharePoint, and what SharePoint does is something kind of cool. It creates the JavaScript sister file that goes with this. So I now have two files, item person twit HTML and item person twit JS. The, uh, the JS file, leave it alone. SharePoint's going to manage that for us. Now, if you remember back to the slide where I talked about the results, the display template is only part of the trick. 
The second part is to create the rule that says, if you find this kind of thing, send it to my, to my display template. So I'll do that right here. I'll come into my um, result type rules. I'll create a new result type rule. And with my new result type rule, I'm going to um, make the mapping between a person and now my new Twitter person. So this is going to be my Twitter person. What are we matching? Well, in our case, I'm going to make it really simple. We're just going to map all SharePoint people. And now I'm going to come down and I'm going to choose my display template. Here, if I didn't rename my, my display template internally, that would just say people item and it wouldn't have the twit on the end. But you would know you had the right one because right over here, come on, right over here, uh, what do you know? Tools aren't working. Uh, it says person item twit. I'll say save. That's not, a, that's not an indictment of our social media. It's just me using shorthand. Okay, so let's go back and do that demo where I did SharePoint and jump over to the people tab. And it takes a moment for these to, uh, to recompile and render. But what we see right away is that for Ruby, for example, we have golden dog Ruby there. And if I click on that, it should open and take me out to her, um, her Twitter site. So we've got those in. I've got one here for Matthew McD as well. Um, so that works for us. But the other thing you'll notice is that there are some people in here that just have, actually <laughs> it just turns out that I have the five SharePoint people are all my early adopters. If I do a star to search for everything, I see that some people just have an at sign. So I'm going to solve two problems at the same time with one demo. I'm going to go back in here and show you another person item that I've created called notary. And so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm going to put in some conditional logic that if you don't have a Twitter handle, don't show the at sign because that looks kind of lame. And also, if you have a skill that you're a notary, let's put a little star on the page that says that you have that skill. So I come down here, here's that name field we were looking at before, and the code just changes a little bit. In this case, what I'm looking at is if is empty string is a built-in function in SharePoint, there's our Twitter account name. So if it's empty, if it's not empty, then, then show it. So we'll show it. Now I've also added another one here, which is look at the skills array that comes back. And if you find the word notary, then go out and find, the, um, find my site URL and grab my variable notary URL and put it all together. So if I employ that one in a result type rule instead, instead of the one we're using now, back into site settings, back into result types, I'm just going to go into my Twitter person here, and I'm going to edit this. And we'll change it to use that notary item instead. So I'm going to change this from people item twit to people item notary. Choose save. Back out. Do that star search. By the way, star is a great search when you're doing your testing because star says, give me everything you know. Give me everything from search. So it takes a moment for these guys to, uh, to recompile. But once they've done that, so I'm just hitting control F5 to see that guy come back up. Just lost it. And it looks like it's working. So let's come back and do that SharePoint search. There they are. So now what I've got is anybody who has a Twitter handle, it shows up. If you don't have a Twitter handle, it doesn't. And we've got the little stars next to the people who happen to have notary in there skills. For some reason, my Zoomer doesn't like the edge of the screen, but you can see the word notary right there in her skill set. So that's what display templates are for. They're for helping you add additional metadata to the, to the page, add additional information, additional callouts based on the data that you're looking at. So what about the refinement down the side? Well, in my case, I have these, um, I have these products that we've been working with, and I use a content type for that.
I use a content type for that. And these content types or these, uh, these products, they have, uh, of course, I have to click on Captain America. I'm sorry for that. I couldn't find Captain UK. Um, and we got red, white, and blue. Okay. Um, so I didn't look that hard. So, not, again. So I've got the product color red, white, and blue. But when I look at the, when I look at the, dis the displays here, these are pretty lame display. So what I want to do is put a refiner over on the side that allows me to see what those colors look like. So again, I can come back in here. I can go into my display templates. And I can go into the filters folder where I've placed a display template for color refinement. So you go into filters. And I've created one called filter color. So the way that I will, I will be absolutely honest with you, it, after really understanding display templates, it took me a lot longer to understand the way that the refiners work. So when you crack this open, it's a little bit more difficult. In fact, even navigating through it is a little more difficult. So what I did is I put little flags in here for my demo so that I could find where I'm looking. This is the all section. If you think about the way a refiner works, you're going to refine down to a few things. You've got to give the person a link to get back to everything. So all is clear filters. Okay? So right there, I just have this, this uh, output filter that says create this, uh, create this link for all. And then I say, well, if I have a selected, selected section, if I have a selected one and my filter is not null, then do something else. And in my case, what I do is I grab the filter and I call, I send in the refiner name and the refiner count. That way, if you want to show the numbers, you, you still have the numbers in your refiner. Okay. And then what I do is I come up here to this function called, um, wait, let's get back up to three. There we go. We come up to this one. This is the actual function that does the hard work. In my case, I'm bringing in color. Right? I'm bringing in red, white, blue, those kinds of things. So in my refiner, what I do is I create little snippets that say, if it's all, then make it aquamarine and put in the special words that just say clear filter. But otherwise, put in the name of the refiner and use the background, change the background color to the color I'm passing in. That alone took about three days of rewiring everything to figure out how it works. But this is how you implement it. You come into your page. Refiners are always set up on the page. You edit the page. And because I put that refiner in the filters folder, I can open up the refinement web part and edit it. And I can choose the refiner designer. Trademark, Matt McDermott. No. Um, and what I'm going to do, I created a managed property that is part of Office 365. And it's down here under refiners. So it says refinable date, refinable decimal. Mine happens to be refinable string 10. Here we are. And I'm going to add that, and I'm going to move it up. Right away, you see I got a little bit of help, red, blue, green, black. I'm seeing my colors. So I'm going to give this a new name. We're going to call this product color. And I'm going to change this from refinement item, which would just enumerate those colors, to my color refiner. And then I'm going to choose OK here. Here's the UI trick. You have to scroll down and choose OK here. And then you can check it in. And you see we get our product colors down here. And we can check in the page. And we should see our product color. So now when we click on red, we got Captain America. This particular one happens to be additive. So if I also choose blue, then I see Captain America as well, because he has both red and blue on his thing. Then here's that aquamarine color with clear filter. I can click that, and it goes away. So using these files, we can modify the UI. To be honest with you, the hardest part of doing this is coming up with the idea of how you want it to look. So if you have somebody that knows HTML that you work with that can generate either something that looks like this, do you know how hard it is to get your divs to go side by side without knowing CSS? So I'm not kidding, OK? I'm not kidding. This is the stuff we waste our time on, getting your items to stack. If a, if a designer comes to you and says, here's one search result, that's how we want it to look, say, great, give me the HTML and give me three. Because then he has to deal with making them stack up and making all the CSS work. He gives you the HTML and the CSS takes you minutes, because all you then have to do is that token replacement that I did, because you just paste the HTML in. 
I won't say it's always that simple, because certainly for the refiners it's not, but for the display templates, we took those 2010 results that our clients created in XSL. We didn't touch the XSL. We just grabbed it right off the HTML page and pasted that into the new ones. And we've done, we've done 2010 to 2013 upgrades in hours, the UI in hours, while the master page people are flipping out because it's taking them weeks to change their UI. Okay. So that's the display templates, that's the query rules. I'm sorry, that's the display templates. And the, uh, the point here is that it's not, oops, let's change that. I don't want to see that. I want to see this. Okay. So when we're looking at our page, the thing that you have to know is that the page is actually made up of a number of different display templates. There are control display templates, so the search box, the page in control, the actual full search web part is a display template. Inside each display temp inside each control template, these are the refinements. This is that filter underscore file. Okay? There are group templates. So if you want to change the way a group of item templates is rendered, you can change that by changing the group template. And then ultimately the item template. So the Twitter item that I changed, it's one of these. You just have to go through and kind of dissect the UI and figure out which ones are being used. And then finally, there's a hover template. The hover template is shown whenever you hover over a hover enabled um, item template. So if you're going to want a hover template, start with an item that already has the hover in place. Okay? If you start with one that doesn't, then you have to wire it all up and it's annoyingly painful. Okay, so we did the custom refinement already. I'm, a, I'm doing this a little bit out of order, but I think it makes more sense. So let's talk about query rule. So display templates, change the UI. I'll be doing some more display template stuff tomorrow, some tricks with refinement around date and things like that. But that's the display template stuff. The query rules. Query rules, I think, are the unsung hero of SharePoint 2013 and Office 365 search because a lot of folks don't know what they can do. They don't know the power of them. I'm just going to scratch the surface because there are parts I'm afraid to click on because I don't know what they do. Okay? So I'm going to talk about how we can do better best bet handling. How can we use query rules to give our end users what they're looking for? Not force something down their throat, but if they trip one of our rules, probably what we're giving them is what they're looking for. We'll also show you how you can improve the query handling through a couple of different techniques and how you can create more intuitive search results. So I'm going to start off with a simple demo that I like to do that I call Better Best Bets. So if I come in here and do a search for SharePoint, actually, let me go ahead and publish this page because that yellow bar is annoying to me. OK, so I'm going to come in here and just do a search for SharePoint. And if I do that search for SharePoint, I just get a whole bunch of SharePoint info. If I search for SharePoint training, I don't get a lot. I get the career training site and stuff like that. But there's actually a, a SharePoint training class coming up. And our, um, our crack graphics department has come up with a little teaser to help us publicize that. So I'm going to go into documents here. And this is the snippet that they gave me to work with. It's a, a class that we're going to be having in uh, Austin. And so what I'm going to do is grab the URL for this. Because this page, and this could be a page in your intranet. It doesn't really matter. But for this demo, what I'm doing is using something called a visual best bet, or what we now call a promoted result. So I go back into site settings, and I go into query rules. And I'm going to be looking at the query rules for the local SharePoint results. And I'm going to create a new query rule. This one's going to be called SharePoint Training. Because I want to force the SharePoint training when people are looking for SharePoint stuff. The query that I'm looking for, I'm going to go for an advanced text query. And I'm just going to say they're looking for SharePoint. Um, they might be looking for WSS or Moss because they really need training. And I really don't care where that word shows up in their query. Then I'm going to come down here and add a promoted result. The title is going to be SharePoint Training.
And if I did nothing else other than that, when they trip this rule, it would just show a little blue check mark and SharePoint training and a clickable link to that location. What I'm going to do instead is render the URL as a banner because the clickability is actually built into that little, um, that little file. Now, this class is being run on May 5th, so I'm going to come down to publishing and I'm going to put in an end date because I don't want it to show after the class is over. So I'm going to come in here and uh, we'll make this expire on May 4th. Now, you could also have a review date. So if you, if you have, uh, in the States we call it open enrollment, when you have that period of time as an employee when you can change your benefits packages and everything. So a lot of times we'll put a review date in there so that the open enrollment rule gets tripped. We want to make sure that as the new content is being generated. Here's the tip. The contact person will get an email to come evaluate the query rule. Do you want to put your HR manager on that list? No, you don't. <laughs> you are the person who gets the email. Then you walk over to the HR manager and say, remember this? Do you, is this still valid? So evaluate it with them. You're the search expert. You know what that means. Choose save. <coughs> Come back to our site. Do that same search for SharePoint or SharePoint training. It doesn't really matter what we search for. and we should get our query rule run. So here's our query rule, and if I click on that, it's gonna take me down to that corporate training site because the clickability is built into the template into that uh, ASPX page that we're rendering in that spot. So the only challenge here is that the out-of-the-box display template for this best bet is of a certain dimension, okay? And so all I'm doing is making sure that my box fills that up and it looks good. That's the only trick there. Okay, so that was the simple best bet that we just did. Now, have you ever had people just tell you flat out SharePoint search sucks? I hear that all the time. Here's an example. I'm working with a marketing director with all of his minions. He's sitting in the front row and we're talking search. And I said, one of the common example, one of the common questions I ask is what do you not like about SharePoint search? You say it sucks and, and there are times when I will agree with you, but I need to know what your use case is. And he says, well, I can't Google with it. And that literally, that was the reaction of the people behind him. Most of them just went, <laughs> like, I can't believe he just said that. Literally, he wanted to go into SharePoint and search the internet. So we created a, a rule just for him that if he typed Google and his search term, we would go get the results from the internet. Okay? So you can do that kind of stuff, but you have to know what your users are trying to do. In this case, I'm going to do something I call a user intent rule. Now, built into SharePoint is this very cool feature. If I type in here, for instance, marketing, I'm going to get a whole bunch of marketing documents. But we call our PowerPoint files DEX. And by the way, so does Microsoft. Because there is an out-of-the-box rule that runs on every SharePoint 2013 site. Whether you implemented, if you implemented SharePoint, you got this. If you're in Office 365, that DEC rule trips this user intent rule that brings back the top two SharePoint, I'm sorry, PowerPoint files based on that word DEC. Now, if your business is building DECs, this may not be a rule for you. <laughs> okay? But the same thing happens for docs. Is it'll bring back Word documents. Okay? So in my organization, we use, we have these things called flicks. And they're video files. So if I jump over to the videos tab, I'll see a whole bunch of videos for employee. So I know that there are videos out there that satisfy this rule. But if I come back to the everything tab, and if one of my employees who heard me call these things flicks, types in the word flick, they get nothing back. So let's fix that. Let's, let's create something called an action rule. So the action rule functions by acting on the user's intent. And that word is the intent that we're focusing on. So back into query rules, back into local SharePoint results, back into new query rules. And we'll call this one uh, user intent. Now in this case, I'm going to choose the query rule matches 
an action term. And the gal that programmed these pages, man, did she do a good job. So here we go. My action rule contains. Well, I'm going to type in flick. And since I always spell it wrong, I'm going to type in F-I-L-K as well. Then what I'm going to do is create a result block. Now, since I chose an action rule, up here it says search box query. That's both words, employee flick. Subject term is just the unmatched terms, employee. Action term, that's flick. In fact, she's so smart, she put my word right there in the text of the description. Cool, huh? Try it at home. This is a brilliant developer who built this stuff. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to type video. And I'm going to launch the query builder. This is where I get to test my query. So in this case, what I'm going to do is make a really simple change. I'm simply going to change this from the query's original source to use the local video result source. That's just video. It's the same thing the tab is using. If I do my test, I find that I'm just getting videos back. So I choose OK. I'm going to put in four of them here. Then down under settings, I'm going to make them look a little bit better by changing this to use a different. I'm going to use the video um, display template. Actually, yeah, I'm going to use the video display template. Now, I have to talk about this little block here. This little block right here that says this block is always shown above the core results or the block is ranked within the core results. I always choose the top one in my demos because I always want them to show right at the top. Okay? In your world, you will probably choose the bottom one, which is the default, more often than not. Here's the reason. I'm a SharePoint expert. I author SharePoint documents. Okay? If I do a rule about SharePoint documents that I authored, then that's going to float to the top. In fact, most of my documents are going to end up at the top because they're very relevant to SharePoint. If I check this, if I check this second one, it'll float within the results rule. It'll float within the stream of other more relevant documents so that if somebody is less, um, uh, less good at SharePoint, to use some horrible English on either side of the pond, um, we want their results to have the most relevant stuff at the top. So most of the time, you'll choose the other. In my demo, I always choose the one that I have there. Oh, come on, come on back. Where's my desktop? Oh, there we go. So I've got my video results. Now I could also come over here and create a more link. So let's add one more thing, V-I-D-E-O. Oops, hang on. We've got a control key issue. V, yep, there it goes. Which happens to be called video results.aspx. And then if we do question mark, keyword, equals, and we grab that subject terms, magic happens. Because it's going to strip off my, my intent word. Choose OK. I know I chose it. There it goes. Choose save. I know I chose save. Choose save again. Come back up here, and we'll do that same employee, video, uh, employee flick rule. Takes a second for these guys to compile. At least that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. There's our rule. So video results for employee. We used a different display template. It gives us a nice look and feel. That's out of the box. We click the show more link. It takes us to the video results tab. It takes off our action term. We get a really nice flow for the UI. And it also teaches your end users, hey, look, there's a video tab. OK? So you can actually help drive user behavior this way. OK, so one of the other things that we have access to is we have access to the user who is executing the queries. Okay, we have access to their username by default, but we have access to everything that is on the user profile. So any of the attributes that are on the user profile, we can take advantage of. With a user query, I can do some fun things. I have, a, um, I have this FAQ. I have this FAQ page, and on my frequently asked questions, I have the location where the question, where the answer to the question resides. Come on. The one thing I don't have time for is for Office 365 to be slow. 
Okay, so right here I've got um, the location is North America, North America, Austin. Okay, so I've got some, some FAQs here that are for um, a location. Ruby happens to be based in Austin. So if she asks a question, if she asks a question that happens to have an answer that is in her location, I want to promote that answer to her. So let's go to query rules. Let's come in here and choose the local SharePoint results. Create a new query rule. And this is going to be FAQ DEPT. I really don't care what her question is. So I'm going to remove the condition. I'm simply going to create a new result block. This is going to be FAQ results. Come into the query builder. And right here, I'm going to use her subject term, but then I'm going to run it against my FAQ search result. So I can test that. I'll show you how to get around it when your results turn, return nothing. But more importantly, what I'm looking at is I have a managed property for the FAQ location. So right here is, oh, it's OWS. These are those fun names. OWS FAQ location. And in this case, if I choose the dropdown, it's only going to tell me the name of the user. But I can swap that out for the actual property name, which happens to be um, SPS. No, it's actually just location. I think I can just do L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N. And then we'll go over to test. The test page, again, completely awesome. OK, I missed that, so let's try this. valid string. Let me try. Let's try. Yeah, I thought it was location. This one I might. What's that? Oh, these are relevant results. That's the, that's the danger of doing a lot of demos with the same data, is that SharePoint starts to learn. <laughs> it's becoming senti sentient. Yeah. So user.location. Hang on just a sec. Home, Delve, it's not Office. Oh, I don't have time for this part. Well, what if I do Department? There it is, Finance. OK, Finance will work. What I'm going to do is, uh, so it picked up her department. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bail on this demo because I have one more important one that I want to show you. But you can actually, that's actually picking up. I'm logged in as Ruby, so it actually picked up my department off the user profile, and I can actually embellish that. So if I change this to Austin, which is what I was actually looking for, then it shows how do I change my password in Austin. So it's actually showing me the search results for that. I want to get to how to promote this and config, and I'm worried that Office 365 is running slow. So <laughs> if you really want to see this demo, I promise I'll show it to you outside the room. But that would end up showing me those two results with her location in Austin, had I chosen, had I actually written down the right query in my notes here. OK, so one last, uh, one last demo here, which is my employee dashboard. So in my, in my fictitious company here, um, I have a, an app that actually runs, and on the benefits, in the benefits department, in the benefits department, um, they have this app that's running, and it will show you from the corporate benefits um, from the corporate computer. It's integrated into SharePoint, and it shows up like this. It's just a little benefit snapshot. Let's them go do a leave request and paycheck and stuff like that. But since the developers did that as a third-party app off of SharePoint, I can actually take the URL to that, and I can create a search experience around that so that if an employee does a search for benefits, I can create a query rule that will run to show them that information. But I want to show you this as a cautionary tale. So back into site settings. 
query rules. <coughs> Wouldn't it be cool if somebody searched for benefits and got that information? So local SharePoint results, new query rule, call it benefits, call it benefits, and again, the query I'm looking for is they're looking for benefits. And in the United States, a lot of companies call this PTO, paid time off. So we'll throw that term in there as well. Then what I'm going to do is add a result block. It's going to be called your benefits. Get rid of all that stuff because I really don't care what they searched for. And what I'm going to do is change this to one because I only want to see one of their items. And I'm going to change the settings to use my benefits item. Okay. So I've shown you everything that's worked well up to now. Well, <laughs> except for that one demo, but we'll leave that alone. So I'm going to search for benefits. And it's going to show me my custom display template with that lookup to the benefit system. In fact, I even maintain all the clickability. So if you click leave request, we take you to that InfoPath form. InfoPath is not dead. It's just uh, been put on hiatus. So we still have the interactivity that we're looking for. But here's the problem. Since I set this up as a display template, you have to have at least one result. Okay? So I have results down here. But if I use that phrase PTO, nothing shows up. Because there are no results for paid time off. Since there are no results for paid time off, it's not going to render your query rule. So maybe use a best bet instead. Maybe use one of those, those uh, best bets. Or simply go to some list, give everybody access to the list, type in the words PTO, and you're done. Because SharePoint will find that. You have one result with PTO, and instantly it came back. That's how we fixed it at a client. I'm not kidding. Because I looked at that, and I went, well, that's weird. Oh, there's no results. Okay? So cautionary tale, there are times when this stuff doesn't work as well as it does in my demo. Okay, having said all that, you remember the Captain America thing and all that stuff. We want to deploy this. So I'm going to go fairly quickly through this because it does take a little bit of time to download the assets. The design manager has this thing called Create Design Package. In the Create Design Package, it will bundle up all of the, ma all of the um, uh, display templates as well as a lot of other stuff and create a package for me. So here it is. And look! include search configuration. I'm going to click create because it takes a second to do this and I will tell you this doesn't work. I will also show you that as long as this doesn't take nine hours to download that it doesn't work. There is another section in, in the search uh, settings that I've been going to called export my search configuration. That exports all of the rules that you've been creating including the ties between the products or the um, the result type rules and the display templates. So you still need the design package along with your rules to make all of this work. Now there's a lot of things that are wrong with the design package. For one, it includes everything, even the display templates you did not change. Okay, so you're getting much more than you asked for. But it is complete. Let's just put it that way. It is very, very, very complete. Um, once this builds this, it's going to give me a download link. And in that download link, I will be able to, um, to pull that file down, that package down. And the package, <coughs> excuse me, is going to come to me as a, there it goes, as a WSP file. So it says the package is ready. Click here to download. OK. I'm going to choose Save As. And I'm putting it in the, let's not put it there. Let's just throw it on my desktop. Okay, so I'm going to throw that on my desktop. We'll go ahead and leave that there for now. I know the search config isn't going to work, so I'm going to go to Site Settings. I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to choose Search Configuration Export. This is simply going to give me a download link right away 
to an XML file that will contain all of my search config. Come on. Four minutes. I don't know. There it is. Save, save as, drop it on the desktop. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out to a search site that is still, um, that has not been changed. This should be called, I think I created it last night, called search five. No. How about search four? Get over here. Yeah, I'm just going to go there and then go end, uh, go end here, delete. Oh, wait a sec. Just thinking about it. Okay, so oh. SharePoint's weird. Okay. So I'm going to do that same thing. I'm going to search for, uh, let's just search for A-M-E-R-I-C, Emerdica. And, okay, so we have nothing here. So let's go ahead and here, Design Manager, import the design package. I'm going to grab the design package off of my desktop, open, import. Ordinarily, what I do at this point after this, after this loads is I go ahead and do that search. Instead, what I'm going to do is just go show you that the design, that the uh, result type rules are missing. It'll, it'll save me a couple minutes. And then we'll go ahead and import the, um, import the search config. Two minutes. Yeah. I, I want to change the ResX file for this and have it say, this shouldn't take this long. <laughs> Actually, thinking about doing that for Chicago. Um, but I, I don't know how well it'll go over. <laughs> uh, sometimes they don't have a sense of humor at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Uh, no, it is just 365 tomorrow. Yeah, it's just 365 tomorrow. Uh, no, it means that it's limited to only those things you can do in Office 365. So, so and you can also do them on-prem. That's right. Okay, so we got our design package in here. So if I go into site settings, and if it actually did do the result type rules, which are part of the search config, then I should see my Twitter person in here, and I don't. So let's go back, and let's go into um, search configuration import. Let's grab this as well. It is not that, it is not that, it is that. Choose import. It takes you to this little hidden list of search configurations that you imported. So you can actually import incrementally. You can import different rules. You can modify that XML file so that it only contains the search config that you're interested in. And by the time it says imported successfully, I should be able to come out here, go to site settings, go to result types, and see my result type rules. There's my Twitter person and my contract. And go into my site collection. I can do that search for A-M-E-R-I-C-A. And I should see, oh, you know what? I won't see the, the um, refiner because that's a configuration for the web part. But if I do a search for SharePoint, HairPoint, that's great, SharePoint, and jump over to people, there's my, there's my best bet, OK? And if I go over to people, there's my Twitter account name, and there's my design. That's when it works. There are a lot of situations where that doesn't work. And the biggest problem I have with it is that it contains all of the out-of-the-box display templates. The package is much larger than it needs to be. Now, it is only a WSP file. Don't be afraid. It means tab. Rename it CAB. You can go in and pull assets out and stuff like that as well. Okay, so just a couple of call to actions and we're all done. Um, these are your deployment options. Whoops, those are your deployment options. Design manager, import and export search config. You have to do them together because the, the design manager doesn't export the search config. Or you can use PowerShell. There's a rich PowerShell vernacular to do this. I showed you how to do the deployment. So 
Read your query logs. Learn what your users are doing in search or want to do in search. Learn why they hate search. I guarantee you, if you haven't touched it, they hate it. Try some basic query rules. Just try, see what sticks with your users, and then try to make your results actionable. There's a bunch of, of uh, search sessions coming up both today from uh, Martin Hatch. He's doing a JS link one. That's great if you're a developer and you want to learn how to do more of the JavaScript stuff in the pages. If you're more on the IT side or on the envisioning side, Joel has a strategy session. And then uh, Waldeck, uh, Paul, and Waldeck again are doing some different search sessions this week. I've got a, a Pluralsight course on how to do a lot of this, plus how to, how to administer shirts on-prem um, that's been real popular, um, that's available too. It's about four hours of search training that includes a lot of the display template work. And um, I'm on itunity.com as well. And there are the references. I'll leave those guys up. Um, this slide deck will be part of the deck. The one that Steve has right now is not completely up to date. This one is. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to bail for the next presenter. I'll be out in the hall if you have questions.